Hi, I'm Laura McNally. I am the Associate Dean for Experiential Education here at the law school, and I teach our health law clinic. It's a pleasure to be here with you all. Uh, we have three speakers on this panel. Our first speaker is Jelaine Arias, uh, Associate Professor at Georgia State University School of Public Health. Professor Arias is a member of the faculty of the Department of Health, Policy, and Behavioral Sciences in the School of Public Health at Georgia State University. Her research harnesses training in law and ethics to evaluate critical challenges associated with aging, including neurodegenerative conditions. Talk about tongue twister words. Thank you all. Um, <laughs> Professor Arias' talk, uh, protecting persons living with dementia who are incarcerated, does the Eighth Amendment work? We'll evaluate the Eighth Amendment as a way to provide protections for persons living with dementia who are incarcerated. Our second speaker is Dr. Mark Fisher. Dr. Fisher is a professor of neurology at the University of California, Irvine, where he holds appointments in the departments of anatomy and neurobiology, political science, and pathology and laboratory medicine, as well as in the Beckman Laser Institute, and he is a member of UCI Mind. Um, he has had continuous NIH stroke research funding for nearly 40 years, and he has received more than 50 citations of clinical excellence as a stroke neurologist. In addition to caring for stroke patients, he is currently engaged in clinical and basic vascular neurobiology research. He is also active in interdisciplinary studies and is a member of the California State Bar. In 2021, Dr. Fisher was named director of the newly formed UCI Center for Neuropolitics, which is perfect for his talk, right? His talk will focus on cognitive decline, decline in American politics. It will review the role of cognitive testing for political candidates, along with the history of the Goldwater Rule. Dr. Fisher will present research findings on the relationship between cognitive decline, dementia, and political behavior among the public, and discuss the voting rights implications of these findings. And last but not least, as I said, my boss, um, in, is her own, uh, is our own Dr. Sharona Hoffman, the Edgar A. Hahn uh, Professor of Law and Professor of Bioethics. She's the co-director of the Law Medicine Center at Case Western Reserve University, and she's written over 70 journal articles on health law and civil rights topics. Professor Hoffman is also the author of two books, Aging with a Plan, How a Little Thought Today Can Vastly Improve Your Tomorrow, and electronic health records and medical big data law and policy. Dr. Hoffman's talk will focus on cognitive decline and the workplace. The question of how to handle cognitive decline in the workforce has received very limited attention in legal circles. This talk examines a variety of strategies that employers might implement, including mandatory retirement age ages, mandatory cognitive testing for older employees or all employees, testing for dementia, biomarkers, or an approach of individualized assessment. Dr. Hoffman will provide recommendations as to how employers, employees, and professional associations can appropriately manage this very sensitive manner. matter. Manner. Um, thank you for letting me introduce everybody. Hello. Okay, so for me, this is a little bit of a homecoming, so I want to just take a moment to recognize and thank Sharona, um, who has been a, a guiding force in my career. So I actually started my career um, at the Cleveland Clinic, and Case Western was kind enough to let me come over and hang out. Uh, Sharona and Jessica Berg both gave me instrumental guidance throughout my career that got me to the point that I am now, including giving me the opportunity to speak case or to teach Case Western students early in my career. And I actually have hired now two Case Western graduates. So um, very much a homecoming for me here. So today I'm going to be talking about a topic that I've been working on um, for about two and a half, three years now. And I just want to tell the story of how this project fits into a larger scope of work. So in 2020, I worked with a, another Cleveland Clinic CFAB alum, uh, Lauren Flicker, and we started to explore this idea of how dementia and criminality fit together in a picture. I was hearing these stories of patients who had been, or, or individuals who had been arrested and at the time of arrest uh, were 
their, it was determined that their inter, their behaviors that led to their arrest may have been the result of cognitive impairment secondary to dementia. And as a result, we started to think about, well, how would the law actually treat somebody who has been arrested and would they actually be liable for the crimes that they committed? We understood that the, the question about whether or not the act was going to be committed was not a question, but what we wanted to better understand was, was there a matter of intent? Could we actually demonstrate that an individual who committed an act while demented had intent? And what we learned through that project was that there was a significant gap in the legal structure as it comes to the combination of dementia and criminality. Building upon that work, I got a funding from the ARCH Network, the Aging Research and Criminal Health Network, to start to poke at this issue a little bit more. Just this year, I published an article that I'll talk about briefly, uh, where we did interviews with uh, we did interviews with attorneys who had some criminal justice experience, and we basically just asked them to tell us how they would imagine providing guidance to an individual who'd been arrested and had dementia. We learned some stuff through that that I will share in just a moment. This led us to start to think about not only what happens when somebody is arrested with dementia, but how are individuals who are aging within the criminal justice system, either because they've been arrested post dementia, post an act with dementia, or they've developed dementia through the system would be treated. Through these collaborations and my collaborations with the Art Net Arch Network, we started to identify that there was a critical gap in the system related to older adults who were incarcerated when they experienced elder mistreatment. That led to this article on the bottom, which was again published, I think just at the end of 2023 or early 2024, where we actually started to try to understand the issue of elder abuse within the criminal justice system. This is now leading to the article that I'll be hoping to place in Health Matrix <laughs> and um, also informing a future R01 that's currently under development, which is a large research grant. So why, why care about this, right? That's the first thing. So first of all, all you have to do is look at that last article we just published called the, For the Forgotten Population. We often under don't think about our incarcerated individuals as those who are aging. Yet we know that data is increasingly showing that our incarcerated populations, those are who are either in jail or prison, are actually, that population is increasingly getting older just like the rest of the United States. And so when we think about this issue, again, it's important to think about it both as older adults who are being arrested potentially for the first time and either being arraigned and then potentially even sentenced and those who are in the system. There's also a third population that often gets forgotten, which are those who are aged within the system and then are released back out into the world. This ties back into my other work that again, Sharona helped inspire, which looks at long-term care services. It's really important to recognize that all three of these populations are at risk of elder mistreatment at all stages. Again, why is this, this population particularly unique? So first of all, older adults who are incarcerated excel, are age at an accelerated pace. The data that we're starting to gather shows that an older adult who is 55 actually has the same risk of chronic conditions as a 65 or 70 year old, which means that we are seeing chronic conditions associated with aging at a much younger age in our, in our um, incarcerated population. As a result, those who work with the ARCH network and otherwise can deem older adults to actually be those at 55 years old or older, and sometimes even as young as 45. This increases the risk for any uh, age-associated illness, including dementia and cognitive impairment. And um, as <laughs> Dr. Barnes has pointed out, a lot of the risk factors that we think about for cognitive impairment are heightened in the incarcerated setting, including environmental factors. Research is consistently showing that anything from air quality to noise pollution can be a major driver for uh, causing cognitive impairment in older adults. Um, additionally, what we're learning over and over again through this research is that systems are not equipped um, to provide the services and supports for older adults who are incarcerated. I think that you could just say that generally our systems in the United States are not are equipped to provide services generally. This is particularly heightened in the incarcerated population. Additionally, individuals with dementia and other cognitive impairment may be at an increased uh, risk for behaviors that constitute criminal behavior and criminal activities. This research is starting to slowly develop, although I will say this is a highly un under-researched area. Again, I think because of the stigmatization, that, the stigma that applies to incarcerated older adults, we tend to want to say, we, you know, they're behind bars. We don't need to think about them. These aren't people who we see every day. Additionally, there can be some sense of moral 
sort of like, well, they, they've they committed crimes and landed themselves in prison. So, you know, why, why invest in them? But I think it's really important for us to recognize that there are dementias, including frontal temporal lobe dementia, where there's an increased risk for criminal behavior. Additionally, this, as I've pointed out, uh, researchers are showing over and over again that the population in geriatric prisons or in prisons is becoming more increasing more geriatric, and we know very little about them. This includes the fact that uh, the typical geriatric evaluation that is done at a PCP is not consistently being done in prisons, and there's limitations and reasons for that. Additionally, we're just now starting to get a better understanding of what is the prevalence of dementia and impairment um, before arrest occurs. So our prior work does uh, actually reflect the potential for criminal behavior. When we did interviews with caregivers of persons with uh, frontal temporal lobe dementia, this is a young onset and more rare condition that often has behavioral symptoms associated with it. We heard consistently from our caregivers that there was these incidents that we deemed when we analyzed the data as, as criminal. Um, some of it can be something as, as potentially benign as this, which is you know this, this caregiver telling us that um, their loved one is prone to steal things, whether it's a newspaper or a pair of sunglasses from Costco. We heard similar stories. We also heard stories of, for example, an uh, a individual who was angry at a gym because he was kicked out of the gym for trying to steal a water bottle and then proceeded to continually try to throw gum in the gym's pool when he walked by. <laughs> so there are these behaviors that we might think is benign, yet when we talked to attorneys, we heard other stories which are more um, alarming, including some of the violent behaviors that can occur as a result of paranoia or other symptoms associated with our, with dementia. And again, when we talked to attorneys, one of the things that was highlighted for us were these two, what we would consider a threshold issues. The first was we've learned that the criminal justice system simply does not have a way for to systematically de detect dementia either at the time of arrest or once an individual has been incarcerated. This is an issue that I will take up in future work once I find a solution, which, you know, is just right there. Um, <laughs> but the major issue, other major issue that we deemed as a threshold issue was the issue of placement. We heard again and again from attorneys that said, yes, once we determine that somebody has dementia, while they're at the time of arrest or after incarceration, we don't have an appropriate place to put this individual. We know that jails and prisons are inappropriate from a safety standpoint. Additionally, they may not qualify for housing at state hospitals because it, it is not actually a psychiatric illness, depending on the state law. Additionally, those placements are typically reserved for people who might be able to regain competency to stand trial, and this is not the population we're talking about. And finally, a lot of long-term care facilities will actually deny an individual for placement at their long-term care facility if they have any kind of criminal record. So this led us to begin to think about reevaluating elder mistreatment and also looking at our incarceration system as a potential sort of petri dish for these types of behaviors to occur. It's important to remember that not only are older adults who are incarcerated who, and that may or may not have cognitive impairment aging within the system, they're also within a system that they're at an increased vulnerability, either from um, the Department of Corrections stakeholders themselves and or from other uh, incarcerated individuals. And so this all really started with a story. Um, my collaborator, uh, Stephanie Prost, was informing us that she'd recently had an incident of elder abuse reported to her um, of an individual who was incarcerated. When she then took that report to the requisite adult protective services, she was told that the adult protective services in that state does not handle elder mistreatment when the individual is incarcerated and was informed that she should take that to Department of Corrections. It does not take much to imagine why there might be barriers to getting the Department of Correction to respond to an incident of mistreatment of one of their um, prisoners or other older adults who are under supervision when they, in fact, were some of the stakeholders that were uh, the focus of the claim itself. So we decided to start to pick apart this issue and think about, well, how, what can we learn from elder mistreatment at the, the community level um, in order to help us understand whether or not the community at level, the interventions that we have at the community level might be beneficial or something that we could model into the prison setting. And so it's important to know that while we could say, yes, the community level um, detection and addressing of elder abuse is perhaps better, and I would put that in air quotes, this is also a severely under understood area. This is just an area that we just don't know much about. So our data does tell us that about 10% of community dwelling older adults have experienced elder mistreatment, 15% of those in residential care settings. 
Elder mistreatment can include financial abuse, neglect, physical abuse, and sexual abuse. Additionally, we know that elder mistreatment, even in the community, is highly underreported. So if you can imagine that only 31% of elder abuse in the community is reported, imagine the underreporting of elder abuse within the incarceration system. We then, because Stephanie is in fact a social worker and understands social models, we decided to see, well, what are the exi existing conceptual models that help us better understand how elder abuse and elder mistreatment emerges in the community? And we identified these two, both the RISE and the A model. And when we started to evaluate them, we started to notice that there were some critical differences in how we think about elder mistreatment in the community versus how it would, per it would emerge and present itself in the prison context. So one of the reasons is that, that this doesn't carry over is that we actually don't have the data to know whether or not we can use that model. Additionally, the thing that we have struggled with is how do you actually define elder mistreatment in the context of a prison? If you look at the definition of elder mistreatment and elder abuse in the community setting, it relies on certain assumptions, including that the older adult is starting from a place of having autonomy. We know that even an individual who's not an older adult who is incarcerated lacks autonomy to make their decisions. They are in fact in a system where every decision is made for them from what time they get up to what time they go to bed, to what they eat and what their activities are. In the community context, we would start to consider that environment in itself to be mistreatment. Additionally, we can know that um, prisons and, and other facilities are not equipped with the types of, uh, of aging in place type mentality that we would expect or hope for for older adults. And so you could potentially make an argument that just the placement and keeping of an older adult in that environment in itself would constitute mistreatment. So as part of our future work, we're going to start to determine whether or not we can recreate a definition of elder mistreatment that is better suited for those who are incarcerated or otherwise under supervision. Most importantly, the models that we previously looked at in the community rely on this didactic relationship between the individual and the abuser. There's an assumption that the individual and there, there's a single abuser and a single individual who is experiencing this dynamic of um, elder mistreatment of any of the types. We know that that's not a reality for incarcerated individuals who may be receiving care from peer caregivers within the prison. So this is a system in which other prisoners are pro actually providing supportive care. Additionally, they're interacting with different guards and different other departments of correction stakeholders and different healthcare providers who may be coming in on different days. So as a result, any model that assumes that there's going to be a one-on-one -on -one interaction affecting the older adult is actually flawed in the context of prison and other uh, carceral settings. And so what we actually found is, and what we're starting to try to understand is that when we think about where we place older uh, protections for those who are incarcerated, there seems to be this very clear gap. We know that community-based protections are not well suited to address this risk. Additionally, we know that there's some barriers to being able to implement corrections, um, to implement interventions and ability to detect cognitive or mistreatment in the context of prisons. And so that puts us in this gap in between of how do we both identify when this event has occurred and also try to intervene upon it. So we know over and over again um, that older adults are aging, right? And we know that there's some particular risks. So clearly I thought when we started working on this that there had to be some legal protections in place. In our article that was published in the Hastings Center, we identified three potential avenues and, and also the barriers or flaws to all of them. So the Prison Rape Elimination Act, while on its face may seem like a nice protection for all prisoners, there's an unintended consequence that we believe might be happening, which is that it can actually lead to neglect. Prisoners will report that when they are serving as caregivers for older adults, they're afraid of what's called catching a PREA. That means that if they provided care um, in such a way that, that triggered the PREA, the Prison Rape Elimination Act, that that would be actually be a violation. This, so this can potentially lead to neglect. Additionally, there's the grievance process, which allows prisoners to file a claim that they are being mistreated. However, what we've learned from the grievance process when we've looked into it is that there's extensive processes in place, including in some states where you, have, you are not allowed to have a third party file the claim on your behalf, so that would require that a prisoner who has cognitive impairment maintains the capacity in order to make this claim for themselves. It's not hard to see why there's limitations there. So in my paper, which is currently very much a work in development, and so thank you for uh, allowing me to give this talk um, as it's being just even conceptualized, 
we've wondered whether or not the Eighth Amendment is the right place to go. So just for all of us to remember con law and criminal law, the Eighth Amendment says simply excessive bail shall not be required nor excessive fines imposed nor cruel and unusual punishment. So what I'm hoping to do is to focus on this last phrase, the nor cruel and unusual punishment, to understand whether or not that is something that we could rely on to provide included protections. I was surprised when I went digging into the case law that I was unable to find any prior case law that explicitly considered the use of, amend the use of this amendment to, uh, regarding elder mistreatment. It does provide some analysis in these three areas. We have case law indicating that um, the Eighth Amendment protects against the deliberate indifference to health, it also protects against hazardous and harmful conditions, and it protects from physical harms. However, when I've looked into the analysis of how these three areas have been applied, it's unclear to me whether or not there's actually strength and enough strength here to be able to provide the types of protection that our older adults who are incarcerated would need. So my questions exist. You know, in the context of deliberate indifference to health, what does that actually mean in the context of older adults with chronic conditions and special needs for caring for older adults with cognitive dementia? Does that mean that, that these individuals who have a heightened need that we would actually trigger uh, the, the threshold for that? Additionally, as I started to say at the top of the talk, we know that prisons and jails are not physically equipped for this population. And so whether or not that would actually meet this threshold is still something to be evaluated. And additionally, this protection from physical harm, we'll need to understand who is the who is that protecting against? So is that physical harm from other prisoners and or from um, officers themselves? And the big question sitting in the back of my head is, is there a standard that would allow the eggshell plaintiff standard to apply here? And how do we think about this population that is particularly vulnerable? So clearly we need new strategies to deal with this topic. Um, I just wanna highlight the ARCH network here, uh, again, who has generously funded my work and it is an interdisciplinary network of researchers, which I think is allowing this kind of work to move forward in unique and um, neat ways. I can't stand up here without thanking the army of people who are taking care of business at home for me while I'm here um, and uh, my research team and my collaborator, uh, Dr. Stephanie Prost, and just to highlight Anna Tyler, who has been working with me since she graduated from uh, CASE. Uh, I handed her off, she now works for UCSF, but she was my very first uh, research coordinator and um, has continued to contribute to this work. Thank you. Over the world and other developed countries. And I, and I know of some examples, but you may know of others of um, in different countries with older populations, particularly Japan or the Netherlands or other examples of where they have had their licensing boards or um, regulation where they've come in and set out certain ages based on this profession that we could learn from those examples because in no way is America an isolated area with thinking about our older workforce and love your thoughts on that. Um, co comparing to other countries, yeah, I did not look into what other countries do in terms of licensing boards. I do know they are more aggressive in other areas like driving and other things. Um, the problem here is that there's a lot of distrust of the government, so we have to be more careful than than other countries are in terms of what kind of you know uh, of testing and and employment policies and so on. But Yes, other countries often handle these matters more effectively than we do. Thank you. Um, I, I think this question is uh, primarily for uh, Professors Fisher and, and Hoffman. Um, it seemed like the, the, the thrust of, um, I guess, both of your presentations was that there's Right, there's some real value add in getting diagnoses as opposed to just information about uh, what this person's behavior is, whether we're thinking politicians or uh, or employees. And and I guess I would just invite you to say a little bit more. What is valuable about the diagnosis quad diagnosis as opposed to why don't we have enough information just based on this person's behavior? Right, if you're an employer and your employee is behaving uh, like not adequately, right? Then you can start talking about terminating them. Um, whereas uh, the flip side of that is right, like if you get the diagnosis and they're, uh, you know, not um, uh, doing a good enough job, but you were already holding them, you know, or keeping them around just because you were, you know, felt nice about it. Like why would the diagnosis necessarily change that posture 
either. And so in both the political and sort of the employment sense, um, what do we get from the diagnosis that we don't get just from, from uh, knowing what they're doing? So, yeah, I mean, if you can convince somebody to retire just based on performance, of course, that's the easier route. But a lot of times employees will say, oh, there's just some stress in my marriage. This is very temporary. I'll do better. Give me a chance. Um, and so the diagnosis will tell you it's not going to get better. So, yes, if you can just get them to retire based on job performance, fine, but sometimes you need evidence that this isn't temporary. So in the political sphere, we have the opportunity to variable extent to uh, assess cognitive function based on uh, actions of spontaneity. Okay? So uh, uh, press conferences, for example, great opportunity to look at politicians' behavior uh, in a freewheeling, spontaneous setting. Um, some politicians do a lot of press conferences, some don't. Uh, and oftentimes, and some politicians uh, go to some lengths to limit or eliminate to great, to uh, whatever extent is possible, uh, these kinds of spontaneous uh, activities. So we don't necessarily have the opportunity to fully evaluate a politician's behavior under spontaneous circumstances. And our view is that uh, cognitive assessment, cognitive testing, first of all, we, we, we don't anticipate that this uh, would or should ever become an absolute requirement. What we are hopeful for uh, is that eventually uh, this will stay. This will be on the radar screen, the public radar screen, to an extent that it becomes custom. Uh, and as you see, uh, already some politicians are talking about it. We have a presidential candidate who proudly announces the results of his cognitive testing. Uh, we have another presidential candidate. Uh, uh, Nikki Haley called for cognitive testing for older politicians. We don't think that this should be limited by age, uh, but it ought, ought to be, in our view, a kind of disclosure, just like uh, we uh, tend to expect uh, politicians to disclose their stock holdings. Uh, we may expect them to disclose their income tax returns. Uh, we think that this is uh, important, useful information for the public uh, to be aware of, and that we're hoping that eventually, if there's sufficient discussion, uh, that this will become, this will enter into the custom uh, for expectations for politicians. Great. Now we have a battle of microphones. So I'm going here because you're dealing with the online uh, folks, and then we'll go up to you. Um, this question came in for Professor Arias. Um, yep, yeah, I'll talk louder though. For grievance requirements um, that require the prisoner to file grievances for themselves, are those prisons making modifications of those policies to comply with the requirements of Title II of the Americans with Disabilities Act? Great question. So um, we don't know <laughs> the answer to that. And that's one of the things that we're hoping to do if we can actually conduct some research in this area. Um, so actually, when we wrote, uh, Stephanie Prost led an article about ger uh, geriatric evaluations of older adults who are incarcerated, and one of the questions that came up is, there is actually, whether prisons are doing it or not, there's an incentive for them not to identify chronic conditions across older adults, because it would, in fact, trigger the ADA and ADA requirements. And while we have not empirically tested this, there's some indication that prisons would not actually meet those requirements. But the getting into the detail about the grievance process is just something that we we truly just don't understand about the system and why we need some research in this area. All right, thank you. Um, it's Professor Arias. Yes, thank yeah. You. So this um, you you had touched on you, your research is on um, inmates, current inmates who are suffering from dementia, but you also mentioned you know when they're released from prison and they're older. Are you finding or, or have you conducted any research on, say you have an older um, 
older person who's been released from prison and now they need services because they're older either in their home or they need to go to a nursing home and is there some resistance to provide inmates those kind of services especially if they're maybe a sex offender a registered sex offender exactly. and if they go into a nursing home what are the rights of the other residents of the nursing home yeah so uh Great question. Uh, I know. No, no, it's okay. So, I mean, there's a culmination of research that's being done in this area by the ARCH network. So we do know that individuals who are released don't have access to services and there's barriers, one of which is that they um, may not, at the time of release, actually be eligible for Medicaid, and Medicaid is our largest payer for long-term care services. So this is an incredible barrier, and recently published, I forget where, but somebody recently actually published this issue about Medicaid being a, a potential barrier to accessing long-term services for individuals who've recently been released. Additionally, we do know that particularly private long-term care facilities have the ability to deny somebody based off of a criminal record. Um, and that could be applied at any stage of the process, right? So even anybody who has been arrested for a minor crime, that might trigger that as well. And while I've not looked in it, I know that Do uh, Professor Mark Lack, or Dr. Lax, has started to consider some of these issues about the uh, about violence among individuals within a residential facility. Um, and I've spoken to him about this issue, about how do we both understand that individuals who are coming out of prison need placement, and sometimes the best placement option would be a long-term care facility, yet that would expose individuals, both other residents and staff, to potential risk, particularly if the older adult, even if, it, they are, even if their crime is unrelated, if they have behavioral issues that make them a potential risk for any reason, that that could trigger that. And that would be particularly important amongst individuals who have frontal temporal lobe dementia and other um, dementias, which might cause paranoia. Professor Arias, um, is the research being conducted only in men's prisons or is, are women's prisons also involved? And is there a difference that you're finding between treatment of older prisoners? Sure. So um, not my work, but Dr. Jennifer James at the University of California, San Francisco has actually taken a primary focus on looking at women's treatment generally um, who are incarcerated. So my work, I, you know, I'm not specifically looking at any particular type. I've been focusing on the legal issues, but amongst the ARC network, we've considered both um, issues. But I wish you to Dr. Jennifer James' work. She's awesome. Great. So thank you all for the presentation. It was lovely. I really enjoyed hearing the different perspectives. So I'm curious in terms of representation of data, right? Because that's really important in our field in public health. Um, we know that the prevalence of, you know, neurocognitive decline is higher in people of color, right? We also know that there is an underutilization of the healthcare system in general, building relationships with PCPs, maintaining them. And then alongside those disparities, we also see an uh, under diagnosis rates, right, for these potential diseases and their progression and prognosis. So I'm curious for those individuals that are not diagnosed with neurocognitive decline and the spectrum of diseases related to them, how do you, you know, work with those individuals as well? I'm thinking, I'm looking at um, Dr. Arias as well, because I feel like, you know, we're looking at diagnoses and all the other presenters that were here today. I'm curious of their representation of the data and, and who's speaking, you know, what, what individuals are speaking and from what perspective, because lived experience is super important. Um, how do you get those voices heard as well, especially if they don't come with a, with a formal diagnosis? Right. So this is a persistent problem right now with dementia research is that we know that um, individuals who are statistically stigmatized, including minorities and both at a racial, ethnic, and um, migrant or rural status are are underrepresented in research. And it's a barrier. So Professor Josh Grill from UC Irvine has actually focused his attention a lot on increasing representation and groups like Emory Center for Brain Health has also really driven research forward to try to make sure that voices are being heard for all the reasons you've said. We also know that these individuals are also the same populations that are already um, exposed to an increased risk of discrimination at a systems level. And so one of the issues that we do need to consider is when we're thinking about these stories, we know that some of our tests, including biomarker tests that uh, Professor Hoffman recognized, um, have not actually been well tested across broad populations because of this underrepresentation. So the BEYOND study from UCSF um, is actually working to try to better improve the diagnostic capability if we're going to be using those as confirmatory screening tests. 
Um, and then also, like I said, I think that the best way about doing it is actually trying to engage with communities, right? So doing community-engaged research to understand both what are the barriers to participating in research, but also what is the lived experience of them identifying that there's a problem, right? So one of the things we see from a cultural standpoint is a lot of times certain cultures will either see brain health differently or see um, presentation of symptoms as something other than cognitive impairment and there may be an additional stigma to actually admitting. What we've seen from my work and actually heard from attorneys is that they see within certain cultural populations, individuals end up committing these pretty horrific crimes because caregivers don't want to relinquish their caregiving role and they get beyond a point that they can actually provide those services and then that leads to a crisis event. All right, last question, because I have to end on time. Um, how might we effectively implement testing and make decisions on that testing when there are still major limitations with our instruments? For example, neuropsychological testing still has issues with testing norms among diverse populations. Genetic testing, particularly for polygenic conditions, has issues with portability and limited utility. Right. So if state licensing boards were to do testing, that's why I said we need experts to either determine that a particular cognitive test is um, informative with respect to job capacity or perhaps do uh, substantive testing of some sort. So the specialty boards already do substantive testing in order to get recertified in that specialty. And some of them are moving to quizzes that people get every few months um, so that they don't have some huge test, you know, every number of years. So a licensing board could perhaps take those scores, which would tell you if the person is able to think and able to process information and just use that as a basis for renewal. So it doesn't necessarily have to be a cognitive testing instrument, uh, a, a substantive knowledge test of some sort or a hypothetical type of test might be more effective. And then also to speak to the neuropsychology point, um, so one of the movements that is occurring right now in the field broadly is to make um, neuropsych evaluation more culturally appropriate. So for example, some of the evaluations rely on object identification, and it, we know that this might be unfair in certain populations. So if we ask somebody to identify a picture of a camel a camel may, may be less likely to be recognized in social, certain cultures or certain parts of the world if that's just some, simply an animal that does not exist there. And so we're trying to understand um, through the Global Brain Health Institute, in particular, researchers there are trying to understand how do we make these tests more culturally appropriate so that they are fair across populations. All right. So thank you all again. And there's now a lunch break from now until one o'clock and uh, go out the doors and I'm sure they'll direct you to where they, they stored all the food. Okay. but if you stand in front of the chairs like move the chairs okay this way so you're closer <laughs> like maybe they're doing you know, one more person that mark why don't you come Cheese. <laughs> 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 
All right, everyone. So we are going to get started again. I hope everyone enjoyed lunch and thank you for coming back. So I have to apologize. We did have someone who is not showing up, Professor Vaughn James, because of a family emergency, is not going to be here. So the even worse news is that you're going to have to hear from me again with a totally different paper on driving. But before I start with that, we are going to introduce our moderator, uh, Professor Catherine Van Tassel, who's a professor of practice here at Case Western and has done wonderful things for our law medicine program.
Welcome to the afternoon session. Can everybody hear me okay? Wonderful. Well, I um, need no introduction. Professor Shonarona Hoffman is going to kick us off. You see the wonderful, it's going to be fascinating. I know it will be. Uh, patient autonomy, public safety, and drivers with cognitive decline. Uh, she's going to kick us off, right? Uh, and then we're going to move right on to our next speaker, um, Professor Nina Cohn. She is the David M. Levy Professor of Law at Syracuse University College of Law, a distinguished scholar in elder law with Yale Law School's Solomon Center for Health Law and Policy, and a member of the American Law Institute. Uh, Professor Cohn is a leading expert in elder law, advanced planning and medical consent, and the civil rights of older adults and those with diminished cognitive capacity. Professor Cohn is a prolific writer and has published numerous articles in top journals and is the author of the well-known case book, uh, um, Elder Law, Practice, Policy, and Problems, which of course we use here uh, at Case Western Reserve Law School. Okay, um, uh, welcome Professor Cohn, we're so excited to have you. Uh, our, our last speaker, last but not least, last but not least, least here uh, is Professor Catherine Pearson. Professor Pearson is a professor of law at Penn State Dickinson Law. She's the author of articles and chapters on long-term care contracts, financing for retirement capacity concerns and filial obligations, and she is the co-author of a treatise, The Law of Financial Abuse and Exploitation. She is a U.S. Fulbright Research Scholar. Her work includes international comparative analysis of laws affecting families, and she has worked as an international consultant to promote better systems for safeguarding and adult social care. The title of her presentation is is it appropriate for the legal system to rely on lucid moments in evaluating legal capacity? Uh, and Nina's uh, our, uh, title is Guardianship from Law Reform to Court Reform. So with no further ado, I turn it over to Professor Hoffman. Okay, so I got um, interested in cognitive decline and driving issues because of various problems we had in my family, which some people probably had in their families. I'll tell you about a couple of them later on, but I will start again with facts and figures. So we have 32.5 million licensed drivers in this country who are 70 and older. 69% of people who are 85 and older have driver's license. That means more than 4 million people. 12.9% of all drivers are 70 and older. Be careful driving home, right? 20, that's because 22 to 46% of them have mild to moderate dementia and they still drive. So one question is, do people with cognitive decline have more accidents? And actually there've been a variety of studies and they have inconsistent results. So some studies say drivers with dementia are two times as likely to have accidents. And another study found drivers with dementia, that's DWD, um, are 10 times more likely to fail on-road driving tests, even if they don't ultimately have car accidents. And that is because you need working memory, multitasking, spatial and perceptual skills, and other skills in order to drive effectively. A few studies have found a lower risk of accidents in people who have cognitive decline but that might be because they self-regulate or because limitations are imposed on them by caregivers. So they may not drive at night, they may not drive in bad weather, they may not drive on highways, they just drive in familiar places to the grocery store and the doctor and whatever. So you would think that state driver license renewal laws address older drivers and try to put some safeguards in place. But that's not really true. So most states either have no special requirements for older drivers 
or they require renewal in person rather than online or by mail, or they require more frequent renewal every two years rather than every four to six years, or they require vision tests. Now, is that enough? I don't think so. So my mother-in-law, when she was 92, she was living in Massachusetts and she said, I'm going to get my driver's license renewed. And we said, no way. And she said, yes way. And she went to the driver's license office with her walker, literally dragging her legs. And she passed the vision test and they gave her the driver's license. Nobody thought to question, well, if she can't move her legs very well, can she manage pedals? She was very proud, waved it in front of us. Um, so that's what most states do. Illinois does have road tests for drivers beginning at age 75. DC and Nevada require medical certification for people 70 and older. I think in Nevada, it's just if you're renewing by mail, not in person. So very limited scrutiny. How about reporting? Maybe doctors are just automatically reporting anyone who's an at-risk driver. Well, my goodness. Um, California, New Jersey, Oregon, and Pennsylvania do require physicians to report at-risk drivers. No other state does. All the states will accept reports, but they don't require reports. Another disturbing thing is police officers are not trained to identify unsafe drivers. They are trained to catch people and give tickets, but my father, when he was alive at the end, drove into lamp posts and mailboxes and other things multiple times, and the police would come and give him a ticket and say, oh, sir, please be more careful. And they didn't think, well, he's done this five times in the last year. Maybe we need to do something more than that. So that was very disturbing. Why don't people give up driving on their own? Well, we don't live in a society that makes that easy. So driving is necessary for autonomy and for remaining socially active and intellectually engaged. 75% of seniors have inadequate public transportation opportunities. They live in rural areas. They live in suburban areas. I think in Cleveland, if you didn't have a car, it would be bad news for most people. Um, and we know how important social interaction is. Dr. Barnes talked a little bit about it, right? It's important not only for your mental health, also for physical health. Loneliness leads to depression, anxiety, substance abuse, high blood pressure, heart disease, diabetes, and more. So it can be pretty catastrophic for people uh, if they lose their ability to interact with others. All right, so maybe there's some other safeguards in place. How about insurance contracts? And by the way, I co-authored this paper with uh, a colleague, Professor Cassandra Robertson, who also uh, works here. She did a lot of this work and we just placed it this week in the Irvine, UC Irvine Law Review, which makes law professors very happy. Um, but anyway, so it will be coming out in the next God knows what year. <laughs> okay. So insurance rates do go up for drivers who are 70 and older. So you might find that. But are you expected to report to your insurance company if you get a diagnosis or suffer from cognitive decline? Not really, right? There is no clear doctrine. Also, at what point would you have to report, because we've already talked about there's a broad spectrum. Would you have to report mild cognitive impairment? Could you wait until it was actual dementia? So this kind of a reporting requirement would be difficult. Uh, we did not find any cases regarding insurance denial because of a failure to report. 
And we did not find any clear language in any car insurance contracts that required any reporting. So if there are any insurance agents here, this might be a gap you want to look into. How about the tort system? Why isn't just the fear of having an accident and being sued enough to deter people from driving when they lose the capacity to do so safely? Well, if you do get sued, cognitive decline is not going to be a defense. You can't say, oh, I shouldn't be liable because I have cognitive decline. I didn't know what I was doing. But on the flip side, drivers with cognitive decline often do not understand the risk of driving, do not think about liability. Part of the issue with cognitive decline is you lose your ability to do accurate risk assessment or in many cases, to even recognize the problem. There have been some cases where family members or caregivers were sued because their loved one drove uh, and had a car accident, but these are pretty heartbreaking. The ones we found, the wife, it's always the man that does this. The wife tried to prevent the man, her the husband from driving and hid the keys and told him not to do it. And he found the keys or stole the keys, got into an accident. She was, uh, she was sued. Um, you know, but these are heartbreaking cases. We don't want that to be the way we handle cognitive decline and driving. All right, so maybe we're all excited about all this new car technology. Doesn't that take care of the problem? And in fact, advocates will say, oh, 60% of accidents could be prevented by safety features. And now we have adaptive cruise control and lane departure warnings and automatic braking and cameras and navigation system. It's all great, but with cognitive decline, there's also a downside. So they have found that some of these confuse people with cognitive decline because it's like, wait, why is my car pulling, right? Or why is it braking? I better press on the accelerator. That's a big problem. Or it could also, somebody who has a lot of safety features might get complacent, might get less careful, less alert because, oh, the car will prevent an accident. I don't have to. Um, Anyone who thought full automation is around the corner, it is not. Um, it's probably decades away, though there are some services that come close to it within very limited geographic regions. Okay, so what can we do? We thought about a variety of options. One, we could make doctors uh, have to report cognitive decline mandatory reporting. This has been adopted in some provinces in Canada, as in I already mentioned, California, New Jersey, Oregon, and Pennsylvania. But studies raise doubts about the efficacy and, in fact, even about physicians' willingness to comply. It is very easy for physicians to say, well, it's just beginning. It's just mild cognitive impairment. I don't need to report this. Um, the studies do not show that mandatory reporting has lowered crash rates and hospitalizations. Physicians are very concerned about the physician-patient relationship, and so they don't want to turn over people to the Department of Motor Vehicles. Their patients are going to hate them or stop coming to get care. Physicians are worried about that. And... Um, physician... Well, also, what... What do understaff DMV departments, departments of motor vehicles, do with the data? Chances are they would ignore it if they suddenly started getting a tsunami of diagnoses, or they might overreact and just anyone who, who, whose name is turned over to them, they might just revoke their licenses, even if that's not appropriate. So there's real concern about this approach. All right, maybe we want to have the Department of Motor Vehicles do some cognitive testing. And yeah, there's a lot of snickering. 
but it is done in Canada and in Japan. So somebody asked, right, you asked, what about other countries? Well, this I do know. Okay. So, you know, could that be done here? Too much laughing in the audience. <laughs> Too much distrust of the government in the U.S. And the thing I'd really worry about is based on my interaction with the BMV personnel here in Cleveland, God forbid they should be the ones to give me a cognitive decline diagnosis. I have not found their bedside manner to be impressive. Other questions, I already talked about this before, right? Which test would be used? There's big controversy about whether any cognitive test is really illuminating with respect to ability to drive. Um, and cognitive decline diagnosis does not automatically mean inability to drive. So when Japan started this testing program, they are very good about follow-up and being conscientious about this. So they found 30,000 drivers had cognitive decline, but they only revoked 674 licenses. Everybody else, they said, we'll check you again, but you can keep driving for now. Another approach from Australia, drivers themselves by law are required to self-report any diagnosis of concern. And then Australia consults their doctor or a doctor. Um, Self-reporting is problematic because many people with cognitive decline don't recognize the condition in themselves or are in denial. So we would have compliance and enforcement problems. And can physicians really assess driving ability, right? This is another thing that physicians say. I can assess neurology, whatever, but I'm not a driving expert. I don't know what test to give or how to interpret test results. And so that would be problematic. All right, so we did happily come up with our own proposal, which we think is better, but you may not agree. Um, so we propose state legislation that would require doctors who diagnose cognitive decline or a disease that can lead to cognitive decline, such as Parkinson's disease, which is often associated with cognitive decline. Once they have the diagnosis, part of the protocol would be to order a driving assessment test. And the only real reliable approach is on-road testing, or if that's too dangerous for a tester, they have now good simulators um, that can let you know the skill level of the driver. So you wouldn't have to have somebody getting into a car with someone with advanced dementia. All right, the only reporting that the doctor would have to do would be you report people who refuse to do that testing to the DMV. You report the names of people who are assessed as being completely unable to drive. These people need to have their licenses revoked and you report any restrictions. So often the person doing the on-road testing is a, an occupational therapist and they will work with the driver and say, don't drive at night, don't drive in bad weather or whatever. And those restrictions should go on the driver's license. So some more requirements, if the person is found capable of driving, you do, it's, these are progressive conditions, so you do need to repeat the testing. Um, we would offer physicians immunity if they follow all these steps. So if the driver continues to drive and gets into an accident, the doctor cannot be sued, even if they were involved in the assessment and ordered the testing. And we do acknowledge that some people are in denial, don't go to a doctor, um, or they might even, if they know that the doctor is gonna order testing, they might even delay going to a doctor, even if they're uh, worried about cognitive decline. So we also think that police officers should be trained with respect to that and should be empowered if they see someone who is older, who has repeat violations, 
part of the ticket should be you have to go get a driving assessment, on, including on-road driving. And that would catch people who aren't going to the doctor. So we think this is a good approach. Um, it would be a huge relief for family members who right now are left to deal with this all by themselves. I remember a conversation with my mother before she died where we said, you have to stop driving. And she said, if you bring this up one more time, I will move and not tell you where I'm going. Um, also, trusted doctors are really in the best position to talk to patients about the need to assess driving and to say, you know, you've been a good person all your life. You do not want to end your life with a terrible catastrophe because you won't give up driving. So we're just going to test that. Um, and again, physicians would get immunity and not have to do those assessments themselves and have the cover of the law requires me to do this. It's not my idea. So we think these are, are better proposals than any other approach that has been taken. And just in case not all 50 states rush to adopt our proposed legislation, we think that doctors should be following this kind of an approach in any case and really thinking about driving when they assess cognitive decline in patients. Um, and this is just an issue that should not be ignored.